Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us um, on this one-hour session um, titled Against the Odds, Funding Tomorrow's World. Um, my name is Wang Feng. I'm the editor-in-chief of FT Chinese. It's my privilege to introduce to you our four established distinguished speakers. Um, but before that, a little bit about the structure of our session. Um, I'll make a brief introduction to our speakers. And then um, uh, for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, we have a list of questions that uh, we prepared would like to discuss with them uh, based on their expertise. Um, towards the end of the session, we'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions from the audience. And at the very end, a uh, couple of minutes for me to summarize the whole session. So that's the rough workout of this uh, bit. Um, I'm very glad that we have a truly Asia-focused, yet truly international session here. Uh, most of our speakers are Asia-based or Asia-related in a major way, but at the same time, many of them work for international organizations. And the title of our session, of course, is about uh, the funding crisis, especially, especially in the venture capital world. Funding for the world's brightest, most innovative, entrepreneurs and uh, startup founders. Um, so if you don't mind, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we'll uh, go this direction in the introduction and in asking the questions. Um, first, please welcome Mr. Soichiro Takashima. Uh, Takashima-san is the mayor of Fukuoka in Japan. Thank <laughs> Thank you very much. And then Ms. Leung Wai Ling, she's the managing director and head of Asia Pacific at a big Canadian public sector pension fund. Uh, please do pardon my French, I'll try to pronounce it. Uh, La Casse de Debout et Placement du Quebec. Uh, probably <laughs> for us non francophones, probably better known as CDPQ from Canada. Then we have Mr. Wilfred, Wilfred Yu. He's the co-chief operating officer and head of equities at Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, which is known as HKEX. Uh, he's based in Hong Kong, of course. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Michael Chen. He's the managing director of DST Global, also based in Hong Kong. Again, as I mentioned, this is a very Asia-focused group, uh, at the same time, highly international. So I'll start with a list of questions for Takashima-san. For, mm. for the sake of our interpreter, mm. we'll ask the questions in one go. But uh, Takashima-san, please do feel free to weigh in, mm -hmm. as a lot of the later questions will have, uh, I believe, common interest for most of our speakers. Uh, please mm. feel free to ask questions mm. or chip in or uh, start debates, uh, that would be most welcome. So we looked up a little bit of uh, uh, background information, especially about the economy of Fukuoka. Apparently, uh, Fukuoka is the sixth largest city in Japan, the second largest port city, but maybe not so well known to Fifth. our audience. Fifth the biggest city. Fifth, wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, grown, it's grown again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is also known as the startup city in Japan, and also one, one of the most affordable cities for startups for young people. That's um, amazing. At the same time, also some kind of uh, uh, contrast for a lot of the world's major cities. So our questions, of course, will be about uh, how do you manage to build a city into such a startup-friendly environment as the mayor, the administrator, uh, the regulator, how do you, what kind of measures uh, does the city of Fukuoka offer to local businesses to uh, foster this innovation culture and ecosystem? At the same time, what kind of lessons do you think other Asian or world cities can learn from Fukuoka? And a second question, um, how do we close the funding gap? Since the title of our session here is Against the Odds, of course the odds are 
funding is uh, drying up uh, in some sectors more so than others, but overall we face a funding dearth. So how do we close this funding gap, especially for social enterprises and impact-driven organizations? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Let me start. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, Mayor of Fukuoka City, Japan. Uh, have you ever been to Fukuoka? Maybe no. <laughs> oh, really? Thank you. Welcome. Next month, uh, uh, Aqu World Aquatic Championship is in, in Fukuoka City. Okay, if you think about it, everyone's just shown that Fukuoka could be the very first time you, know, you have ever heard such time like Fukuoka. And the Fukuoka is actually the city where enjoying the fastest growth rate in the population. And the tax income growth rate is the fastest in Thai Fukuoka as well. And the startup opening rate, fastest and the highest in Japan. And it's Fukuoka is a probably the youngest city in Japan as well. And in a 2012, uh, Fukuoka made this declaration as a startup center city. And for the growth of the city, we always uh, set uh, the startup as a core part of our strategy. And in the Abe administration's uh, strategy, Fukuoka was selected as a startup hub. So, and based upon that background, we really focus the startup as our, our city's strategy. So, and we, I want to talk about how those uh, local uh, businesses can get the uh, fundings and how we can grow startups. Obviously, as a local city, we face a lot of challenges. Bef previously, we had a lot of co-working spaces, but we actually consolidated as a, a platform, a hub, in the really the center of the city. By having such an integrated hub, and if an overseas in investor want to invest in startups in Fukuoka, they just have to go to that hub and gather information about all those potential or existing startups in Fukuoka. So, and in this start. Now, if you think about the local startup companies, they find it so difficult to send the messages and introduce themselves to the potential investors from overseas. So, and then also, we, Fukuoka has been selected as a specific, special city for the, uh, um, the regulation testing experiment. But utilizing that uh, position, we are um, asking central government to further um, deregulate the startup uh, related the regulations. For example, startup visa, we started that as a uh, pilot city in Fukuoka, and that you know, was successful, and now it has been spread across Japan. So Fukuoka has been used as such a pilot city. Thank you. <laughs> Again, uh, please do feel free to weigh in with uh, later questions. Um, Ms. Leon. Again, um, you work for this very large public sector pension fund. Yes. And pension funds, especially North American pension funds, are traditionally known to Asia uh, startups and Asian innovators as a kind of a bedrock of funding flow as well as a um, cross-border technology flow. Right. Um, there is a balance, very uh, delicate balance game that uh, funds like yours need to play uh, in terms of uh, fostering innovation as well as providing stable, safe uh, returns for your uh, public sector investors. So my number one question is uh, how do you manage this kind of very delicate, fine balance between innovation and risk? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, uh, which we ask ourselves a lot as well. So, you know, managing 300 billion US, that's our asset under management. Uh, and that clearly in itself, and yet 
the way we see ourselves is that our chief responsibility is towards the 6 million pensioners in Quebec. So, you know, we need to provide that return. So that is first and foremost of what we do. And the truth is, venture capital, especially very early stages, we tend not to do a lot of that outside of Quebec and Canada. And the reason being, you know, very early stages, your returns, you know, I, I've always called it, it's, it's an analog situation, you know, it's, it's one versus zero. Um, and that's not how we are geared up um, as a pension fund. So I, that's the clarification. Um, but having said that, I think moving forward, because today's topic is really about how do we invest forward, uh, you know, with all of these global trends going forward. So if you look at climate, trans you know, if you look at climate, if you look at energy transition, uh, those are very tough and challenging topics. So, and we see ourselves as a provider of constructive capital. So, so to just to give you an example, so recently we partnered with an Australian company uh, to do Agritech uh, because that is part and parcel of uh, food safety uh, because that's something that all of us are very concerned with going forward. So, so we are open to it. It's not exactly very early stage, um, but that's kind of where we are going. And then the other thing that we're looking at, I think that affects all of us globally, would be, for example, sustainable uh, jet fuel, uh, because that's one of the key things. And that's something which Canada uh, is actually, we're quite big on that, uh, you know, on, in, in terms of going forward, the future of, of sustainable jet fuel. Um, so there are a lot of such examples uh, that we talk about, and I'm very, very happy to, to, to share also, we actually have got a US $10 billion wa wallet um, to finance energy transition, uh, and that is global. Uh, we can invest globally. But that is quite difficult to execute in reality, because for transition, you know, it's, I think it's much easier to invest in new, uh, green ventures because you know it's green, it's new. But to to do transition, you're basically looking at investing in a, in a company that is highly polluting, and yet investing in the transition, uh, and that is difficult. Um, so, but that's something that we are committed to doing. Uh, so far, we've only done three transactions, um, not huge, um, but I think it's kind of a work in progress there. Great. I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Um, ESG, um, in the years before this, this would be one of the hottest topic, topics, but apparently sometime during the pandemic, somebody announced ESG is dead. Uh, so we don't see too many people talking about it. But for pension funds, public sector pension funds especially, even if we don't say ESG out loud, um, the sustainable social impact is still always a serious criteria that uh, not only your investors, but also local public opinion, uh, local political forces hold pension funds against. And for Asian, especially greater China uh, companies and innovators these days, uh, there's a feeling that, um, well, we do offer good returns, but now you guys face so much political pressure domestically, you're pulling out from some of the most profitable projects. So again, people are holding you to increasingly strict, sometimes draconian standards. How do you balance the pressure versus the uh, uh, performance criteria uh, uh, meters? Uh, how does this work for pension funds these days? Because it's so specific to pension funds, so I can't even pass the question on. <laughs> Um, well, we have tougher ones for him. Yeah, tougher <laughs> ones for him? All right. Um, I think it's always about a balance. And fortunately for us, uh, because of our size, we tend to do large ticket transactions, whether it is public or private. So the reason being, so as a result of that, we look at every single investment. 
Um, and we always start by looking at the partner, the quality of the partner. And I think that is, we do that with or without ESG angle. The quality of the partner is first and foremost. So we're looking at the, the quality of the management, we're looking at governance, we are looking at integrity, uh, we are looking at reputation of the partner. And that's something that we're highly cognizant of as a pension fund. The fact that we, we, you know, we are returning 8% over a 10-year period, that's our average return. But still, you know, anything that kind of brings us to the headline uh, locally, that creates a lot of, of unnecessary uh, disturbances. So I think it always comes back to the quality of the partner. And, and I think that is really first and foremost. And obviously, we've invested significantly um, in our own team uh, to be looking at data mining of ESG. We've also invested, um, you know, we've also engaged external technical advisors to help us uh, with each and every single um, large transaction. So I talked about energy transition earlier. So to demonstrate that the company is committed uh, to transition, say, over a five-year period from a brown to a green, um, that company would actually be, be, will have to be subject to a very highly technical um, audit every year just to see that it is indeed progressing. So I think that, that doesn't quite change. Into, you know, obviously, we're very aware of public opinion about ESG, but deep down in our heart, I think the way we look, we assess, that hasn't changed at all. It's always about the quality of the partner. Great, thank you. Um, if I may follow up on ESG, <laughs> sorry. Um, there seemed to be a diverging trend between Eastern ESG standards, Asian ESG standards, and Western ones. Um, you work for a, well, North American pension fund, but you are also based in Singapore. Uh, do you personally feel that uh, uh, between Asia, between the East and the West, uh, ESG is increasingly starting to mean different things? Okay. I think the, on the E side, on the environment, on climate, I think that definition is, is quite common across yeah. all countries. The only challenge that you have is that we talk about just, you know, whether it is, it is you know, done with justice. Because obviously, in this part of the world, you, we have a lot more of developing nations. So, you know, I'm, I'm highly, highly aware of that uh, discussion. So, we participated in B20 Indonesia. We are participating in the B20 India. And so, the debate has always been, that you know, the developed nations have benefited uh, you know, by, by investing in all the polluting industries. And now that the developed nations have become wealthy, and it is now the turn of the developing nations who want to develop and yet will not be allowed. Uh, so, so I think that, that is a, there's a lot of debate on that. But in terms of the definition, I don't think there is a difference between how we measure uh, carbon intensity. But it, it's, um, you know, I think we probably need another day to be here. If, if we want to talk about, uh, you know, fairness, we want to talk about, for example, carbon taxation, we want to talk about how do we solve this, I, you know, but this is probably not the forum for that. Now, I think where there's probably a little bit more of debate uh, is on the S and the G. Yeah. Um, and so... That is something which, again, we have to take that into context. Um, but there are some things which I think we kind of draw certain red lines uh, that to say that, look, this is where we will not go. And then the rest, we, we will look at it case by case, uh, partner by partner. But there are certain red lines where we, as a North America-based pension fund, we simply will not cross. Great. Thank you so much for your candid replies. Um, I'd also like to remind our, uh, all of our speakers, please do feel free to weigh in on issues, even when uh, we're grilling one particular 
uh, speaker he's with questions, please do grilling. feel free to <laughs> weigh in in their defense or, or uh, feel free to challenge them some more. Um, Mr. Yu, um, coming from Hong Kong, I feel I don't really have to um, put more pressure on you because on a month-by-month -month basis, local media is examining HKEX performance. How many more listings today compared with last year, compared with the year before? So um, you guys are under so much public and uh, uh, government pressure already about uh, uh, helping uh, startups, helping companies raise funds. Um, so my questions are, um, as a stock exchange, how do you collaborate with other regulatory bodies, uh, industry groups and companies to, to, to create this uh, supportive ecosystem even though you, you guys yourselves are under constant and huge pressure? Um, for example, um, from Hong Kong's point of view, um, there seem to be um, very delicate differences between the different regulatory bodies, for example, in their attitude toward the crypto industry, toward the Hong Kong government's latest push to embrace uh, crypto and uh, uh, um, digital currency companies uh, exchanges into Hong Kong. Um, so, so number one question, how, how do you work with and coordinate with all of these other coordinate bodies and uh, government and public forces. Um, yeah, I, I have to agree with you that you, you do raise some really difficult questions and it's a lengthy questions and there are so many dimensions that I can touch on and everything I said can be totally wrong. Um, but having said that, I, I, I just think that as an exchange, right, we have a core role to play. Our, our core role is actually offering a very resilient market and building a market for, for need. And therefore, I think what I personally advocate for a lot is actually we have to be catering our de the developments um, uh, in the view of what the market trends and needs are, right? And working very closely with our regulators, uh, with all the vested stakeholders, and you know Hong Kong, there are a lot of stakeholders, right? Um, uh, and, and making sure that they, they are aware of their developments. Now, if you look at Hong Kong so Exchange, we are, a, um, a, a super connector between the East and the West. Uh, that's how we're positioning ourselves. And, uh, and it, it, if we look at it, uh, we, we, we have been working very uh, proactively in terms of um, spotting the trends of the future and how we're positioning our market initiatives to cater for those, right? So um, if you look at Hong Kong Exchange, the evolutions, if you look at maybe our market five years ago, Right. What, would, what do we have is uh, we have a lot of state-owned enterprises from mainland listed and maybe some private sector companies, in particular real estate companies and, and uh, a few of the big you know, kind of tech giants in Hong Kong. And then fast forward to today, right? Um, you look, have a look at it. Um, you, what you realize is Hong Kong has already transformed into a new economy uh, stock market. In the last five years, um, Hong Kong has successfully built up a uh, very significant biotech um, uh, sec you know, segment set. In total, we have 114 stocks listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange and, um, and becomes um, Asia's number one biotech uh, fundraising hub and also world's number two. Um, so apart from uh, the biotech um, sector that I, is worth mentioning, um, there were a lot of changes that we brought into our um, uh, Stock Connect program to just make sure capital get connected with the opportunities to make it life easier for everyone. When you have money you want to invest, you want it to be invested. You want that risk to be managed properly in, in all, the, all the, um, on the right dimensions that you want. And therefore we have that role to, to play to, to uh, enhance our, our Connect programs. And just last year, we launched multiple um, of our Connect programs, Swap Connect being one of them, ETF Connect, and that's on the back of a first successful Stock Connect and Bond Connect program. So we become the, the effective, um, very efficient trading, settlement, clearing, and risk management hub for all those um, risks that everybody wants to transact in day in, day out, and in, in, in massive, massive ticket size, right? So that, I, I think, is, is what we are, uh, have been uh, working very hard on. And the next journey is important as well, where um, we have latest uh, uh, announced is uh, our um, specialist technology um, uh, 
chapter, 18C, uh, which we are helping some pre-commercialization um, tech companies to come to Hong Kong to list. And that will include areas in like um, advanced material, advanced software, hardware, chips, AI, cloud co computing, uh, agricultural technologies, um, new energy, you name it, right? All these are all right in the center of what we have been discussing in these two days in this forum. So I'm really excited about that, and um, I think the fo important point is focus on what the market wants and deliver what the market wants. A second question also has uh, to do with social impact and ESG. Um, again, on this front, Hong Kong, fa especially HKEX, faces um, multiples of demands from international investors, local Hong Kong investors, Chinese investors, uh, companies from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, you need to take care of local social impact mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, fostering innovation, creating jobs. You need to take care of international companies coming to Hong Kong to list uh, to show them um, that uh, um, there's enough liquidity, there's enough uh, um, support for them. Um, and at the same time, you need to take care of, it, at least you need to be very much aware of mainland regulatory trends. So again, people are holding you to a whole host of different standards on ter in terms of impact, social impact, in terms of uh, governance. Um, how does that balancing game work out for, for you and your colleagues? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, another great question, but a tough one as well. Um, so so my, my view is actually that we, we are very fortunate, Hong Kong being the most international city of China, being the most Chinese city of, of um, global. Um, I, I think that is, um, we have a very strong foundations that we can cater for a lot of cultural differences, a lot of languages differences, legal system differences. So, so, um, so on, on one end, when, when I turn here, I, I may be able to speak uh, English here and turn to this side and uh, Mandarin and then you know, that part of, uh, of, of movements is, is natural, become part of our natural DNA uh, because of the evolution of our marketplace and, and the professionals um, who are, um, have been very successfully coming up in, in Hong Kong to help um, catering on all those needs. And, and um, I, again, that, that gap can be very, very wide, right? Um, and, and that journey can be very difficult. And, and how you get good at certain things and uh, it's a lot coming from lessons that you learn along that journey itself, and that's be, you know, what makes you uh, who you are today, right? So I think we are, Hong Kong, in the, and, and in particular in that location, I think help us uh, to allow that to, 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 to be um, in that position. And therefore, and coming back a little bit more on the ESG front, that we are a, a very strong advocate um, for ESG here in Hong Kong. Uh, apart from ourselves being a, um, a, a, a um, regulator, also for uh, listed issuers, we have multiple programs that we have, um, a lot of uh, governance requirements, disclosure requirements that are falling into either climate and, and gender and, and all these other uh, issues that we want to put in and advocate for our uh, listed issuers. And on ourselves, right, from a, a, um, a natural commitment, we have also have signed um, a, a couple of those agreements to make sure that we remain on track with, with that, as uh, setting ourselves as an example. And, um, and also as a market operator, we promote a lot of ESG products also in, in Hong Kong, and we want to uh, draw on more the increasing trends on how the global adaptations of um, different ESG standards in, in Hong Kong. And I strongly believe that, you know, well, the world can be diverse in this approach and this, this preference. And slowly, slowly, you know, what things likely going to happen is they're going to converge into an, an areas of an appetite and the risk statements, which is going to be um, leading to the next kind of big you know, kind of wave of, of growth. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Michael Chen, um, DST Global obviously is a um, big name in the venture capital world. Uh, with stellar records with uh, um, American um, tech companies, with Asian, especially Chinese tech companies. There are some uh, um, great success stories going back as many as 20 years, even more. Um, so in today's world full of uh, geopolitical uncertainties, uh, economic headwinds, how do you manage um, to detect 
the emerging trends and technologies that are shaping the future. How do you manage to still be on the front catching all of these opportunities uh, compared uh, you know, with uh, a rising competition from every corner? Uh, what's the secret here? Thank you for the question. So um, as uh, our moderator mentioned, we are a late stage privately firm focused on technology and internet sectors. Uh, we have the fortune to have invested in most of the largest consumer internet companies in the world. Uh, in the next cycle, we think, you know, one thing we're spending a lot of time on is artificial intelligence. Um, you probably have all heard in a lot about uh, artificial intelligence, but I will just offer my two cents on the subject. Um, so I think a lot of the magic happening with AI comes from the ability for us to train very large models on a very large data sets. Um, this comes from both innovation in hardware and software. And as you can imagine, in these data sets, there are a lot of human knowledge in there, a lot of critical thinking, and a lot of even some human social behaviors. So when model, after learning all those, they have all those, you know. So example, right, ChatGPT was able to achieve 100 million monthly active users within two months. Um, this compares to nine months for TikTok, 30 months for Instagram. And it's able to do that because it's so human-like, right? So we like, we're surprised by that, that ability. Um, and, and that's why it has grown so fast. Um, and, and then so that's, that, that's one thing, you know, on user uptake, right? But what people usually miss is just on the, um, the change on the supply side. Uh, as we interact with those uh, chatbots using natural language, um, these, um, um, these innovations also lower the barrier to create, <coughs> create programs. Everyone can become a programmer. Every company will become an IT company, right? So, so imagine that, you know, uh, the, once that barrier is lower, um, there will be an explosion of new innovation happening there, right? So then you have both supply and demand. Um, um, so that's, that's why we are quite excited about this space. Um, but that said, in order to make this work, I think it takes everyone's um, you know, uh, work on it. Because today, AI, these uh, models, they are probably like high school students or maybe college students at best who have learned a lot of books, read a lot of books. But they have not gotten you know, a job. They have not get trained in the vertical um, space. They don't know what's right, what's wrong. right? So I think that's where you know, people here um, can make a difference. All business leaders, political figures, regulators, scientists, engineers uh, have to work together to shape a better future with AI. So that's what we think would be quite exciting. Thank you. I think this is the first panel I've moderated, I don't, I don't know many, how many months, that the word chat GPT didn't appear until the second half of the session. So now that you've brought it up, uh, let's get on with it. Um, <laughs> AIGC, obviously, um, among this uh, landscape of um, funding gaps and uh, funding shortages, AI, AIGC, chat, GPT, like large language models, these are getting um, tons and tons of money. But still, even within the very hot AI sector, there are certain sectors where startups are still getting starved for funding. Eagle-eyed investors, deep-pocketed investors may have their eyes dead set on a very tiny pocket of opportunity. Uh, you can ignore everything else. But what about advice for um, innovators that focus on other subsectors within AI? I mean, uh, some of them may prove uh, promising a couple of years in or, or later on. Um, but if they do face a sh funding shortage right now, um, what kind of advice would you have for them? Yeah, may maybe I would talk about an example outside of AI. Uh, because right. now that, that, that term has been talked about so much. So we invested in a company called Baibu, which is a, a textile B2B marketplace. Um, what they do is they connect um, demand from apparel brands with textile companies. So think of, you know, similar to how Uber and DD connects user demand and drivers, right? So, um, and uh, a lot because 
a lot of these uh, apparel brands used to base near the regional area of China. So these weaving mills that they work with are also located in the regional areas, uh, coastal areas. And um, um, as you know, wage uh, increases over time, um, these weaving mills, they have to move inland, right? But in order for them to move inland, they need infrastructure first. They need warehouses, they need like, electricity and the like, right? But investing in infrastructure is not necessarily a uh, high you know, return value proposition for investors, to be honest. Um, so what happened was that uh, local government, um, provincial government, they invested in this uh, infrastructure. And they invited our company, as well as uh, a lot of small business owners, to join them over there. So essentially, the government took care of infrastructure um, um, uh, and get the job creation and get the future tax revenue. Um, and then our company does the IT, does all the order um, you know, orchestration, uh, the coordination. And then this small business owner, they are responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of these uh, weaving mills, right? So this is actually a pretty good example, in my opinion, um, uh, for the public sector, cap public capital, and the private capital to work together in a pure market-driven um, market way. Great, thank you. Um, somehow, I still feel that uh, this session doesn't have high enough of uh, chat GPT or AI content. Uh, so before we open the floor to questions from the audience, uh, I would love for uh, every speaker to very quickly address the question of AI again, or chat GPT. Uh, the question is basically, how do you think AI uh, is going to change your particular sector, especially in terms of uh, um, helping with a funding gap, uh, either as a um, target of invest investment or as a technology that could help improve your mechanisms, your processes. Uh, Takashima-san, is mm. that something you may be interested in? AI, uh, running a city, running a city for startups, how does AI, AI help you? Mm. That's a very difficult question. In Japan, the chat GBT and AI, uh, there are lots of sectors who, who, which, is, which are trying to think about and uh, starting to debate how to utilize those technologies, AI, chat GBT. So especially, this is starting. So, you mentioned about the word market driven. But ChatGPT's answer doesn't become the, ra I mean, it's and supposed to get some rational um, answer. But what I'm thinking is the difficulty or challenge of that we may not be able to get the rational answer with the chat GBT in terms of economic rationality. They might be uh, not really uh, matching, but uh, we got uh, some issue that the problem of the poverty and uh, social issues. And so these issues, challenges, are not really investors driven or is not going to reach to match with the investors return so what are we going to do with those things does not match with the market returns so I, I, I cannot answer to your I mean I have not answered to you directly to your question but that's the way I feel as an answer thank you Thank you very much. I think that provokes further thinking for us on this. Uh, Ms. Liang? I'm, I'm quite convinced that for the investment community, uh, AI would definitely be playing a very big part. Um, so, you know, I think we, as, as investors, if you look at, you know, so for, from the public equity point of view, We've always been looking at, you know, whether you are a value investor, whether you're a growth investor, whether you are quant, you know, there, there are so many different permutation and combination. And I think AI would definitely have the ability to help us, um, you know, plow through the data and, and, you know, help us to make some sense, more sense out of it. Uh, and ultimately, we will still have a core team 
uh, to, be, to be deciding as to you know, which, which are the best options. But I think from that perspective, I'm quite confident that it will definitely play a very significant part. And then on, the, on what do we invest in, uh, again, I think AI is really not really just about the tech sector. Uh, it's really going to cut across uh, every single sector, almost every single sector that we invest in. Uh, so, so I think as global investor, we have to kind of understand and think through what is the impact, uh, and not just about today. Uh, and that, I think, is the difficult part, is to kind of think through what, what is the potential likely scenario for all the sectors that we invest in. You know, so I'm just, just using myself as an, invest, as an example. You know, I'm not a good investor personally. So I remember I was laughing my head off, uh, what, 15 years ago, when my kids were telling me, oh, you know, you could go stay in somebody's house uh, and pay for it. And I think you would have guessed which company I was talking about. And I said, over my dead body, um, you know, never ever. Why would I stay in a stranger's house? That would be the most scary thing. Um, and I'm totally proven wrong. So I think that it's kind of, it, it tells us that I think what is the potential impact of AI on all the sectors that we invest in? We have to kind of think it through and, you know, be very out of the box and come up with various scenarios. Uh, and that's real. Um, I don't think any of us here have the, all the answers, um, but it will be here. That's a very illuminating anecdote. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Yu? Oh, uh, that, that's a really great question. I, I'm always intrigued by how that is going to affect the trading market. And for a moment, uh, allow me to just, re, you know, take myself out from my exchange role and I have to go, go back to my own old career has been in, um, in, in sales and trading. You know, the, the first phase, very first, first, first phase of my career has, has been in, in an active risk-taking positions where it's done more by human, okay? Um, and then the next phase I saw the market uh, evolving into is more rule-based, core models, and plus passive investment. You know, so very deterministic, you can say, okay, well, this is doing better, this is doing less well, alpha generations, and you can measure all those. And now we are moving into this, this phase where, well, you think about the trading market and there will be more, more AI coming in. Um, they can be coming into robotic trading and other areas. Uh, uh, other areas, and, and people will mine different kind of data set itself to, to try to give themselves a, a bit of an edge versus uh, the others, and that will also affect the way the, the market behavior looking like in terms of stock select selections, and or how you handle the tackling of the different liquidity segments of the markets when, uh, with certain predictive models around liquidity profile changes across events, for example, and be more systematic and disciplined in in executing those strategies in, in this versions of robotic um, trading and AI trading. So I, I think a combination of those things will be adding on a lot more fun in, in the trading market itself and also adding challenges, I think, to, to um, the associated regulatory regime that should be fit for future as well um, so that these segments can be actually properly um, uh, addressing the future needs. So that is, I think, from a trading market perspective, that I, I think is, I, I very much look forward into how that is affecting um, uh, the market. Great, thanks a lot. And Mr. Chen, we went through this already. Maybe you could uh, tackle this from a different perspective, a different angle, uh, maybe on how AI could help you with making investment decisions or something like that. Yes, of course. Um, so I think there's a lot of worry in the market that, um, or in the world that um, AI will replace jobs. I think, um, I think, but we believe that AI is here to make our lives better fundamentally, right? Some jobs will be lost, but they will be replaced by new jobs. So um, I can give you an example, you know, how a day would change, right, with the AI. So um, suppose I, you go to work, you need to um, study a subject. Instead of reading through a 100-page document, today you can just ask the model the three questions that you care about the most, right? Why should I read through a 100-page if I'm only interested in three questions? So you can quickly go through that. So that's, 
um, uh, a big change to education, to learning. And then you need to um, write uh, an investment memo, for example, right? Make an investment decision or investment recommendation. Um, with the learning you take from the model, you can use natural language to quickly produce a document, right? So that is already able, you know, that's already doable today. Um, and lastly, because um, you finish your job so quickly, you have more time to play, more time to play. And you go home, you can use natural language to create a game, right? Today, if you know how to do Roblox, um, you need, still need to drag and drop, and you need to know how to program, uh, very basic programming, in order to create a game. But in the future, you can just use natural language to create a game. You can create a game on the spot, uh, a game that only you would like, or you, you know, based on your preferences, right? So I think, I think AI will fundamentally change the way we work and, and, and live. And I totally agree. AI will take over the moderator job. I don't, <laughs> you don't need me to ask questions in the future. Um, I think I've done my damage. Uh, now it's turn uh, for our audience. Please do feel free. Any questions for our distinguished speakers? Um, You're very fast. Um, <laughs> not, not <robot. laughs> thank you, thank you for your comments. This has been great. My name is Claire Tilka. I'm a property developer here in China, but in this here out of interest, so I'm a very passionate angel investor. And a question, really, for each of you, particularly just given the funding gap that we're in and may be in for a while um, with traditional VC, is what do you think angel investors can do? Uh, to be more active or to really build up that network to make sure that we're not missing that next wave of funding these great entrepreneurs during during this time. And question for any particulars? Uh, kind of for all of the panelists, but I'm quite quite curious to think how how Michael how you think about it, and and then also from a pension perspective. But really for for everybody, I think this is across the board. If you have invested in some good companies, we can talk. Um, but, but I think um, um, depending on which stage you are in, I think for later stage investors, um, we tend to be more sort of um, uh, call it momentum driven or you know, we have to look at where the market is. But if you're earlier stage, you have to do it day in, day out, year in, year out in a more sort of consistent way. And, um, and I think because of the funding environment, um, it would be difficult for an early stage company if they don't have um, a very good product, for example. They don't have differentiation, right? Uh, things that you could, ha you could do in the last 10 years, you know, subsidy-driven growth or using a lot of um, online marketing to drive growth, um, that, those days are probably gone for now. Um, so what you want is to find companies that are um, more product-driven, uh, more fundamental, right? More sort of um, um, have disruptive technology, right? So I think I think uh, if you can find those, um, they would do well when the next, you know, when when the market comes back. Yeah. I, you know, I see more questions. Um, you know, but I think for angel investing, that's not something that we do. But my point, I think, for angel, I mean, the market is the market. If the market is soft, the market is soft. And that's reality. And I think in today's world, a lot of the, of the very early stage companies would, are very likely to have to tap on government grants, incentives to start. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the reality on the ground here. Uh, because they're not, because the market as a whole, it's, it's not as active. And that it will probably last, I think, for the next one, two, three years or so. And you kind of have to find a way to survive and to, and to live uh, until the very next stage. Thanks. Uh, Hi. Um, a question for Leong. Uh, so I am Canadian. We have a pretty substantial AI R&D site in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, and we also do a lot of drug discovery work here in China. And uh, um, 
I am a very firm believer that you know people misunderstand China nowadays because uh, it's growing. It's uh, more open than it used to be ever. Uh, much more democratic than it used to be ever. But um, in the media, we see a lot of negativity about China. As a matter of fact, when we decided to open a site in Montreal, even though I'm Canadian, we almost got into the National Security Review, uh, believe it or not, uh, which was very strange. Uh, and it looks like people are very allergic to China because of the media pressure. So my question for you, you are running a large pension fund, $300 billion. So first, uh, how do you um, uh, deal with this media pressure, right? Because again, investing in China is guaranteed return long term, right? More than 7%. Uh, so if you invest conservatively, the economy grows at 5%, right? Uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, you need to invest in China. And uh, um, I think that right now, media pressure and just political uh, disarray is dissuading companies like, I mean, organizations like yours from investing in China. So I wonder how do you deal with that? And uh, how do you deal with the negative sem sentiment? And also, are you planning to invest in China? Um, our public statement is that we are invested in China. So, so that's, that's the first thing. And I think as investor, there are, and I think it's not specific to China, uh, there are always sectors that, you know, you get a lot of um, pressure. Uh, you get a lot of negativity simply because there are cycles. So, you know, if I just to give you an example. So we invested uh, in crypto. So we invested in a company called FTX, right? So, so that in itself, um, so I'm just using that as an example. So the fact that we invested in FTX, um, and the truth is, it's, it was 150 million US. Um, and 150 million US out of a $300 billion fund. Uh, so it, for us, it's always about a total portfolio allocation. Uh, and it's resuggested. But you are absolutely right. We got a lot of negative press for months for months, and it appears on, as headline every day, every other day. Um, and to, to, to use, and one of our Asian peer, was also a pension fund, um, you know, did the same thing. They invested in, in FTX too. So they, they had the same experience as us. We both appeared in local papers. We both were called to local Congress to explain why we made such investments, et cetera, et cetera. So all I'm saying is um, we will obviously take all of this into consideration, but a large part of what we do is total portfolio allocation. So we look at concentration, we look at diversification, uh, we look at macroeconomy, we look at sector trends. So we combine all of that uh, before we decide. Um, and that is something that will remain how we invest. I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks. We have time for maybe two more questions. Um. Thank you. Uh, happy to see DS, first of all, happy to see DST Global's name because uh, truth to the topic of funding the gap, uh, DST just led the round that we were an investor in. So uh, it was a company called Levitt that was based in Korea. Uh, just last week announced. So, but, uh, so my name is John Ha. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, GS Ventures, which is a corporate venture uh, arm of uh, a GS Group, which is a Korean conglomerate that is a, a culprit of some of the uh, carbon producing and because we do oil refinery and power, power generation. The question that I wanted to ask across the board is that uh, what the trend we see, it, including ourselves, is that corporate conglomerates such as ourselves uh, do uh, is increasing corporate ventures uh, as part of open innovation, and uh, we are trying to uh, have a more expansive role because we can. Uh, we're trying to use uh, startups as part of our transformation in terms of transforming our uh, existing uh, big companies. How does that, in terms of perspective, from a uh, both as a government or both as a, a pension fund or a, 
of VC investment because traditionally, you know, startups and uh, traditionally don't accept a lot of uh, big corporate money, and it was purely by financial investors. So, uh, you know, there's always a fine line of how big of a corporation plays and uh, how active and how passive that is. So, I wanted to hear the perspective from a uh, financial institutions and also from the city uh, perspective, how they feel about that. Um, well, maybe I will start. Um, I, I think um, we really welcome the participation from corporate ventures uh, and companies in general because they are very different from financial investors in the sense that they can invest very long term, right? Um, um, as lo long term as we are, you know, we have a fiduciary duty to return capital to our limited partners, right? So that usually will not last more than five, seven years. But corporate, um, you can invest 10, 15, 20 years. So, so that really complement, you know, what financial investors can do. That's number one. Number two, um, because um, a lot of these startups or innovations happen in the same or adjacent area of corporates, you know, operates in. So they have a lot of uh, insights, and there are a lot of synergies between the smaller company and the larger company, right? So, and they can cr provide a lot of capital uh, 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 for that development. So we, we, we actually work quite actively with corporate investors. Takashima-san, yeah. mm -hmm. corporate venture, is that something you may be able to respond to? <laughs> yes, there is um, a lot of expert, and you're talking about a various, a very, very high expertise, and I don't have any, probably it's not proper for me to talk about my, uh, the, the topic, but uh, you are talking about investment, that's the main topic. And of course, this summer Davos has been uh, realized in four years, in the pandemic, everything was stopped, but and and also ESG has been stopped. But in order to um, better the world and the global uh, arena, and simply the ROI, I mean, there are some things that we have to invest or that the uh, flow of the fund in the area where we cannot see the ROI um, in short term. So I think this is the question that we should fundamentally ask about. Of course, I know we don't have time to think about it, but uh, if, if we can, we would like to talk together with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more question from the audience? Yes, please. I wanted to thank the moderator for uh, bringing up AI. Uh, I have a question. So um, I understand that you know robo advisory, robo trading is a big thing uh, with the capital markets now. But I'm more interested in how AI is going to play a role in more traditional valuation of assets uh, under management. So. One of the things that really bothers me, I, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Charlie, I'm a CEO of Urban Metry. We are a city data company. Um, one of the things that worries me is how traditional, like real estate, big infrastructure assets are valued and how AI is going to transform that and if that's going to change the balance sheet in any, in, in, in any way. So I wanted to hear some perspective from the panel if you see any uh, sort of big disruption in that sense by AI towards the uh, traditional ways of valuing uh, real assets? Okay. We're all looking at each other. <laughs> um, I, I guess we're talking about private assets here. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Real assets. I mean, real assets, precisely. Um, so, I mean, but because if it's public, you know, it's a lot more transparent. So, you know, so if we're talking about private here, um, I think today there are, I think there are only that few methodology out there in terms of how you arrive at a valuation of a private market, right? Um, and this is something that I think it's still very much work in progress as to see what are some of the 
uh, additional validations um, that can be brought in to, to basically help with the actual valuation process. Mm -hmm. And I think that validation uh, is probably a very key segment of that. Uh, because today, it's kind of, you make your best judgment based on representation uh, from the company, you look at industry peers, you, 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 you try to do all of that. Um, but I think if you have sufficient AI data where you could really be having a lot more real-life data coming from users, uh, be it corporate or consumer, I think that will change the landscape uh, with regards to validation significantly. Don't know whether that, how long that will take, but I think that will be the direction. Great, thanks a lot. I think our last woman standing deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Takashima-san, Ms. Leon, Mr. Yu, Mr. Chen, um, for your very strategic thinking on the balances between short-term returns and long-term vision, long-term uh, impact especially, and also your thoughts on AI. Very much appreciated. And thanks a lot to our audience. Thank you. Thank you.